everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we're the Minimalists. Danny Unknown, get that TikTok machine ready because I have a question for everyone. What's one thing that you've purchased that you soon regretted? Mm. Seriously, let me know one thing in the comments because today we're talking about consumer regrets and buyer's remorse on the Minimalist Podcast. Why? Well, because we often buy things that we think we want just to find out that the things we want aren't actually the things we want. Then this Thursday on the Minimalist Private Podcast, Ryan and I are going to talk about our own personal consumer regrets. We'll ask our team to open up about their consumer regrets, and we'll turn to our audience to hear about myriad other types of buyer's remorse. Plus, Ryan, now that the smoke has cleared, we're going to argue about Will Smith slapping Chris Rock during the Oscars. <laughs> My goodness. And we're going to talk about all the backlash that the minimalists received recently on social media on two separate occasions this week. You can check that out at patreon.com slash the minimalist. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free. Malabama, looks like we've got a question here from Holly on Facebook. What good does regret do for us? Is it just another form of destructive attachment or is there some sort of benefit? Ryan, we, we are attached to regret. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if regret. Mm. I mean, ultimately, yes, it is some sort of attachment. Mm -hmm. I don't know how destructive it is. And so I, when I saw this question from Holly, I started looking into, are there any benefits of Regret? Yeah. And I actually found something from the NIH, and I printed this out. There's a couple different studies about regret. Mm. And I was really shocked by this. So let me read this as a jump-off point. We usually do this on the Maximal episode, but I thought this was a perfect answer to her question, and you and I can talk about it. Yeah. What do people think about the emotion of regret? Recent demonstrations of the psychological benefits of regret have been framed against an assumption that most people find regret to be adversive, both when experienced, but also when later recalled. Two studies explored lay evaluations of regret experiences, revealing them to be largely favorable rather than unfavorable. Study one demonstrated that regret but not other negative emotions, was dominated by positive more than negative emotions. In both studies, number one and two, although participants saw a great deal of benefit in their negative emotions, regret stood out as particularly beneficial. Indeed, in study two, regret was seen to be the most beneficial of the 12 negative emotions. Man, Ryan. And hmm. it goes on to say, uh, why, why it's beneficial. So in short, mm -hmm. people value their regret substantially more than they do other negative emotions. Hmm. Here's why. And it goes into one of the studies here. Regret triggers behavior change aimed at remediation. So when we regret something, we often change the behavior that led to the regret. Right. And I think quite often the other negative emotions like stress or anxiety, we don't make any change. Or if we do, it doesn't affect the stress or anxiety as much mm -hmm. as the regret. Yeah. And finally, it says, in other words, information gleaned from regrets can guide future behavior aimed at achieve, achieving desired outcomes. Yeah. Man. Uh, well, you know, Tony Rob Robbins to talks about when you have a strong emotion attached with an action, like that is um, like a really good way to change your state. So I could see where regret would totally be a useful emotion because yes, when you feel negative, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's, uh, that's what we do with our lives, Josh. We are running away from pain mm. and discomfort. So, yeah. you know, the more discomfort we experience, the more we want to get away from it. So when, you, when you do something and you regret it, you feel that pain mm. and that pain triggers some sort of change within you. Right. It's like you don't want to re-experience that, that regret. And here's the thing about regret, too, is, it, you know, regret is, first off, it's silly to moralize regret. It's mm -hmm. not good or bad. It's just regret. Yes. So um, it all depends on how you're using it. And if you use it to learn a lesson then that's valuable. But if you're using regret to uh, beat yourself up with, that regret is going to turn into guilt. And then that guilt 
will turn into shame. Mm. So in that sense, uh, regret, not so useful. But if we use it to learn something, that's really where the power is. Yeah. So if you're holding on to the regret, not making any changes, not learning the lesson from the regret, Mm -hmm. I think the opposite of that is fascinating as well, because people often talk about how do I let go of the regret? And I think Mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about that on this episode as well. In fact, let's move on to our callers here. If you have a question or a comment for our podcast, give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. It looks like we have a question here from Mike in Schaumburg, Illinois. What if you donate something to charity and then you think about purchasing that product again, what's behind that? So Ryan, Mike is asking about the regret of letting go of something, Mm -hmm. but then, oh, I'm thinking about buying this again. Yeah. Now, it seems to me there are a few reasons that we would think about that. Let's say I I went and donated our toolkit, which is useful and we use it every day. Sure. Well, that was a mistake. I, by letting go of that, I'm actually depriving myself of something useful. Yeah. And so that might be one reason that you're like, oh, hey, I got rid of this thing that I actually found useful. It Mm -hmm. didn't make sense. It didn't benefit me to get rid of it. Yeah. I've done that with a blender. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, Mariah and I are moving and I'm like, we don't really use this blender. We don't really need it. We got rid of it. And then about six months later, there was like, you know, three, four or five times where I was like, man, I really wish we had a blender. Uh huh. Um, So, yeah, I mean, uh, yes. I think in order to decide whether or not something is useful, you can totally, you know, look at the the minimalist rule book that we have, which is really just a minimalist boundaries book. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also on our book, Love People Use Things. And, you know, you can ask yourselves these questions to see if it's something that you actually are going to miss. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things have a season, though, you know. So maybe maybe you buy something. It's really uh, important to you at the time. You're using it, and then you you don't use it for a couple of years. So you look at that rule book, mm-hmm. and you're like, "Oh man, this like totally like if I take the seasonality rule, yes, this is uh you know I have I used it in the last ninety days. I'm going to use it in the next ninety days. Uh, if I answer no to that, I'm going to let it go. Or the spontaneous combustion rule. Hey, uh, this thing spontaneously combusted. Would I replace it? And if I'm answering no to those questions, then I'm, I'm giving myself permission to let go. Right. But then, you know, two years from then, it might be something that I need to bring back in my, into my life for whatever reason. Yeah. And I think it's okay to realize that you might need it. You might need to bring it back into your life. It, there may be a season where mm-hmm. it's not useful. Yeah. And so you're essentially putting it in a storage locker mm-hmm. that you don't have to pay for in a way. What I mean yeah. by that is like, let's say it is a blender. Yeah. Uh, the example that comes to mind is we were in Albuquerque and this guy said, hey, every time I need a chainsaw, I need it like once a year. Yeah. That maybe I'll, 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 I'll buy it from Craigslist and then yeah. I'll put it back in the storage locker, Craigslist, right. so someone else has access to it. Mm-hmm. And then the next time I need a chainsaw, I'll go there and I'll, I'll do that again. Now, obviously, there are certain things like that you could even rent so you don't have to hold on to them in perpetuity. It's not that you should hold on to certain things or you should let go of certain things. Mike, if you haven't checked out the rule book, it's the minimalists.com slash rule book. But those rules are basically some parameters. It's free. You can download it. There's 16 different rules for living with less in there, but they're not really rules. They're boundaries that are completely adjustable for you, whatever season of life that you're in. Now, let's talk about where else that regret might be coming from. Hmm. That feeling of, oh, I shouldn't have gotten rid of that. So we talked about, hey, if it's useful, obviously I'd didn't want to let go of the thing in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we have to be careful because we can justify, we can pretend anything's useful. Sure. We get confused and think, oh, this this junk item, you know, I'll hold on to it just in case, which is one of the 16 rules for living with less, the the just in case rule. However, the other side of this is, hey, I got rid of the thing and now I'm thinking about it because other people in the culture have that same thing. Mm. So maybe you Hmm. got rid of your expensive car. You were driving a Lexus and you downgraded to a Toyota like I did, right? And now all of a sudden you see Lexuses everywhere. As soon as you got rid of your Lexus, it's like, oh man, and the the heated seats and Mm -hmm. and and we we overvalue the things that other people have. And then we get the things that those people have and realize it doesn't have the value that we thought that it had in the first place. Yeah. Well you can TikTok that, Danny. Whenever I mean whenever you're purchasing anything for you know to impress someone else or to to make yourself look a certain way to someone else. Mm -hmm. Um 
you know, that's, that, that is a, uh, a dangerous road to go down because certainly there are times, like if I'm going to court, I'm going to want to wear a suit, right? Yeah. So like there is a, there's something that, you know, I want to, um, I want to put on or wear to like show respect or whatever it is. Um, you know, I used to go to like, I'd get invited to weddings and I would wear like my zero shoes and my shorts and like a t-shirt. And it was more of a statement of like, Hey, I'm not going to buy a suit just, so, just because I have to go to a wedding once a year. Uh-huh. But then, I, you know, kind of looking back on it, I'm like, Ryan, you're kind of a jerk, man. Like, you know, like you're, you're, you're there to honor the bride and the groom and not, not that anyone was ever offended, but I wasn't going out of my way to like, you know, show respect for that specific event. So there are times where it's appropriate is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. But if it's, but if it's a virtue signaling, well, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to bring that Rolex back into my life because, you know, I see more and more people wearing them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where it might be a little bit of a dangerous path to go down. Right. Because it's never ending as Mm -hmm. well. So you get the dream Mm -hmm. The dream job, the dream Mm -hmm. car, the dream house. And those things turn into a nightmare. As soon as you've acquired the dream, what happens? It'd be great if you acquired the dream Mm. and it satisfied all of your desires and you felt wonderful, you felt fulfilled. Mm -hmm. But what happens? New, bigger, better dreams pop up. The five-bedroom McMansion isn't doing it. I need the six-bedroom, seven-bath McMansion. It never stops until you identify what is enough for you. And so really, when we're talking to Mike, what we're talking to him about is you feel like you don't have enough. And that's why you feel like, Oh, I'm incomplete. I need to bring this thing back in. Did it complete you before, Mike? Of course the thing didn't complete you before. Mm -hmm. Now, let's be honest. If it added value to your life, wonderful. Then don't deprive yourself of that. Maybe temporarily deprive yourself because that will teach you whether or not it actually added value. But if you're feeling the remorse, instead of figuring out, should I buy the thing? Should I not buy the thing? Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, why? Do I feel that remorse? Mm -hmm. Do I feel incomplete without the thing? And if so, will that thing complete me? Mm. And of course, you know the answer to that. Now, Mike, great news. We're going to be in Chicago this month. And I'd love to give you a couple tickets. So Podcast John, if you could reach out to Mike, give him two tickets to our Chicago event. Now, y'all, we'd love to have this event sell out. So if you're anywhere in the Midwest, we're going to be in Chicago and Minneapolis. These are the last two stops for the American version of the Love People Use Things Tour. Ryan gives a minimalism talk. I do a book reading from our book, Love People Use Things. But then the best part, a live version of the Minimalist Podcast in front of an audience where you get to participate in the podcast. So Mike, come on out. We'll be in Chicago. We'll give you a couple tickets for that. Or if you're in Minneapolis or anywhere in the Midwest, make that road trip. We'd love to see you there. We'll also be in Toronto and Vancouver later this year to finish off the Love People Use Things Tour. And Ryan, we should probably mention, since uh, we have a hundred of these, Uh, If you need to connect with open-minded people locally, we Mm -hmm. have uh, these free local meetup groups. So say you can't make it to one of our live events. You want to connect with some open-minded people. We have uh, something called minimalist.org. Yeah. Minimalist.org. You can find free local meetup groups Eight countries, a hundred different cities, including an online city, if you can't make it to even any of those meetups. Yeah. Now that people are finally meeting again, it's a great place to meet some open minded people to talk about minimizing, simple living, career clutter, financial clutter, all these different types of clutter that are in our that are in our lives. Yeah. I mean, man, the pandemic is like finally uh loosening up a little bit to where people are starting to meet back in person. Yeah. So, um, yeah, minimalist.org, like people are getting together and they're talking about all things simple. Uh, some of them are still doing like Zoom only meetings, mm-hmm. but still in most of the cities, there is a way to connect with a group of open-minded people. Now, if you go to like one of the cities and it says, hey, sorry, there's not a community leader for this city. So that means if there's no leader, there's no events being planned. You could totally step up and lead in your city. You can just yeah. shoot us an email. And then there's a real, there's a link. It's real easy, real intuitive. Um, but yeah, it's really exciting. Like just to see, um, just seeing people get back together and like, yeah, in these gr- in these groups are it's amazing. And you're doing a monthly theme with those right now as well. Yeah. So right now, uh, April, we're doing simple living. So that's a pretty broad topic. I it's, mean, it's a great place to start yeah. because with the monthly themes, and then we'll get more specific. You know, get, go into calendar clutter, yeah, financial clutter, mm-hmm. relationship clutter. Yep. Doing a monthly theme 
time when when you're meeting. So if you want to connect with some open-minded people, some like-minded people locally, minimalist.org, find the city closest to you. Mike, enjoy those tickets to the Love People Use Things Tour. If anyone else wants to go, theminimalists.com slash tour to find Chicago, Minneapolis, Toronto, and Vancouver. You can also find recordings of past live events, including the magical New York City event we just did. Oh, with, with Godin. Oh, Seth Godin and yeah. TK Coleman. Yeah, and, and TK, yeah. One of the was... most magical nights we've ever had. Yeah. Theminimalists.com slash tour to find the cities nearest you and recordings of previous events. Malabama, do we have any questions or comments? How about some regrets from the live stream? Shout out to our Patreon supporters who tune in during the live stream each week. We have a few regrets. Uh, from Yaman, before embarking on my journey of becoming debt free, I leased a Jeep that was my biggest consumer mistake. Mm. Everyone told me not to, and I justified it every which way just to do it. Mm. Man, it's there's something wrong with leasing a Jeep, right? Again, we're not trying to moralize anything here, mm-hmm. but it sounds like uh, he could not afford it, and or uh, or or maybe he lost a little bit of money on it. Yeah. And oh man, I I don't even want to talk about the you know the new Toyota. I brought, I bought every couple of years because my, in my, in my mind, my simple mind, mm-hmm. every time I needed like major work done on a car, when it was going to be a couple thousand dollars, I'm like, I'm just going to trade it in. I don't have to put anything down. There's equity in this one. I'll just move it over to this one. And instead of spending $2,000 now, I'll just get this, you know, $200 or $300 a month payment. And uh, that made total sense to me until... I think it's like when I bought my my third new Toyota. Um, I, that's that's one of the things that I felt regret with, and I learned like, hey man, like if I would have just stuck with that first one, it'd be paid off. I'd have no monthly payment. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I had to learn a lesson the hard way. But man, I'll tell you what: you go to that dealership and you sit in a new car, and they give you the keys. They're like, have fun, and it's got the new car smell. Oh. And this one had Bluetooth. I mean, that was like I don't know why, but for some reason, that was the one reason why I got the car was the Bluetooth. In hindsight, I'm like, I could have just got a stereo with, you know, replaced my stereo with Bluetooth in it instead of, you know, spending 30 grand or 35 grand on this car. It's the most expensive Bluetooth adapter oh ever. Oh my gosh, dude. Oh. I was talking to Danny about this beforehand. Danny Unknown, he does all of our TikTok and he's actually running the audio right now while Podcast Sean is out today. Don't worry, Mike. Podcast Sean will listen to this and get you your uh, your tickets. <laughs> anyway, uh, Danny, he had to upgrade his phone recently because his phone just kept power cycling over and over and he couldn't use it anymore. It was mm-hmm. rendered useless. It was mm-hmm. a paperweight, basically. And the thing he avoided doing, which I thought was a wonderful little tip for folks, is he didn't go into the store. He didn't go into the iPhone dealership because oh. that's what it is. Oh, man. All that new phone smell in there. <laughs> it really is. And he was like, I know I, I, know I didn't want to invest that's another word we use oh my invest God. yeah in the iphone 13 pro because we can justify just about anything yeah. you get to that dealership you can justify buying a new car oh, yeah. because you don't have bluetooth you can justify buying the most expensive iphone just because your last one stopped working even though it you don't need all the extra features necessarily now mm-hmm. if you do be honest with yourself but also be honest with yourself if you're justifying oh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to be able to use this. All the the behind-the-scenes footage I'm going to be able to shoot with this new iPhone Pro, Mm. right? It's going to make me a better photographer. I'm going to use this gear or whatever. No, 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 no. Creativity Mm -hmm. is birthed from limitations. Mm -hmm. So constraining yourself temporarily actually makes you more creative. You can have the most expensive pin from Mont Blanc or whatever. You buy a thousand dollar pin. You're not going to write better stories with it. The same is true with a car, with an iPhone, with a suit, with a pair of jeans. No matter what it is, that item is not going to make you a better version of you. It's not going to make your activity better necessarily. Mm. However, if you feel as though you're depriving yourself, great. What are you learning from that deprivation? Mm. Why do I actually need this? Can I get by without it? And will my art or my creativity actually be improved without making the upgrade, without making the purchase? Yeah, man. I cannot wait to talk on the maximal about the statement we made about car payments that drove people wild. Oh, by the way, we're not intentionally trying to piss anybody off. Just a heads up. (laughs) We we just did. We just did. Yeah. (laughs) A lot of people. Yeah. 
And so, yeah, we'll talk about the maximal. Ryan, before we get into the lightning round, I've mm-hmm. printed out this article about buyer's remorse. By the way, everything we're talking about today, we'll put in the show notes of the studies that I read earlier. Podcast Sean, we'll throw those in the show notes. And this is just talking about the sort of broader definition and understanding of buyer's remorse. We'll put mm-hmm. a link to this Wikipedia page in the show notes as well. Buyer's remorse. So we're talking about consumer regrets, obviously. Mm-hmm. Buyer's remorse is another way to put that. Buyer's remorse is the sense of regret after having made a purchase. It is frequently associated with the purchase of an expensive item such as a vehicle or real estate or an iPhone Mm -hmm. uh, or an expensive suit or a wedding dress or Mm -hmm. there's a bunch of things we'll talk about on the Maximal. We have a lot of regrets for our audience has, has talked about their regrets and also Danny and Jordan and Malabama are here. They can talk about their regrets mm-hmm. as well. I already know Malabama's and uh, you'll want to hear it. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Buyer's remorse is thought to stem from cognitive dissidence, specifically post-decision dissidence that arises when a person must make a difficult decision, such as a heavily invested purchase between two similarly appealing alternatives. Factors that affect buyer's remorse may include resources invested, i.e. money, time, attention, Mm -hmm. worrying about Mm -hmm. the thing, right? Mm -hmm. The involvement of the purchaser, whether the purchase is compatible with the purchaser's goals, I would say, or their values, right? Feelings encountered post-purchase that include regret. So, So you may not experience the regret when you're buying it, but when you're in the parking lot, or when you get home, mm. or when a week later when you get the credit card, or a month later we get the credit card statement. Now that regret starts to sink in. What have I done? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it talks about the causes here, Ryan. Hmm. It says the remorse may be caused by various factors, such as a purchase a person purchased a product now rather than waiting. Remember layaway? Oh my god. That was a thing. And so it was the opposite of financing. Yeah. It was essentially saving for a specific item, giving your money to Sears. We used to do this. My mom would drive us to Middletown, Ohio. Right. There was a Sears catalog store right next to the Hills department store. Mm-hmm. And we would go and put money every Friday on the thing we wanted from the Sears catalog. Wow. And then we couldn't get it until it was actually paid off. We, we didn't have a credit card right. to ha- bring the thing home in advance. Isn't that interesting? Because you could do layaway by yourself. Just put $5 away in a jar every week or whatever yes. it is. Yes. But uh, yeah, it's just funny how we need like a third party to, <laughs> to like help us save that money. And there, I mean, there's something there that probably is a deeper conversation, but it's just interesting to me that layaway, anyone can do layaway. Like it, you, don't, it reminds, you don't need the store to do it for you. <laughs> right. Do you remember the piggy banks where you they didn't have a... You just put the money in, but then you had to like break it in yes. order to get the money out? Yes. Jerome, my brother and I, uh, we had one when we were kids. Yeah. And I remember when we got it, it, like we put a quarter in it. Yeah. And then like shook it and we're like, I think there's more money in here. And immediately <laughs> we just broke it open. Immediately? Yeah. And there was just a quarter. Oh my goodness. That's hilarious. <laughs> and so that that perfectly illustrates like our desire to get more right now. Even as kids, it was like, I was talking to my daughter about this last night and I said, Ella, have you, have you ever regretted buying anything you brought into your life? And she said, homework. (laughs) 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 Now, first off, it's crazy. They're giving third graders homework. It's a little absurd, right? In fact, the new school that we're looking at for her doesn't do homework, which um, is what I'm totally on board with. Yeah. Uh, because if she's compelled to do things that she can learn outside of school, then it doesn't feel like work in the first place. Yeah, totally. Like doing this podcast with you doesn't feel like work. Right. It is technically our vocation. Right. Or at least part of it. Yeah. And the layaway thing is fascinating because, yeah, we would go there every Friday. We'd put money on the thing we wanted to purchase. Mm-hmm. But it was rewarding our future self by being responsible with our money. Mm-hmm. Going into that's the opposite. We're punish, punishing our future self. Mm. We're borrowing from our future, yeah. going into debt to buy these things that we think we need. Mm-hmm. And we get that burst of dopamine, that pleasure. In fact, I had this essay here from Kapil Gupta. I'm not going to read the whole thing, and I can't put a link to it because it's a private email. But he said, pleasure is the poor man's way. Mm. And uh, I'll just read a little excerpt from here. Uh, This is from Kapil Gupta, one of my favorite thinkers, philosophers. 
one might call him a stoic. He wouldn't call himself that. He said, one chases pleasure for a dose of good feeling. He chases pleasure because he is bored. Most of all, he chases pleasure because he has not found the fountain of truth. If one finds truth, everything pales in comparison. Pleasure is the poor man's way. Electronic addiction, socialization, consumerism, whatever it may be, stopping would do nothing for him. After all, what else is such a man supposed to do? He seeks a dose of feeling. He does not wish to deny himself. And even if he did deny himself, this would do nothing either. Truth lies not in denying oneself. Truth lies in understanding what he does not know. Understanding what one does not know arises from a desire to understand. Mm. It's a longer essay, but what I like about this, Ryan, what I'm thinking about this is if you understand that thing you think you want, Mm -hmm. you probably won't actually want it. Unfortunately, we tend to not understand that $30,000 Bluetooth adapter Mm -hmm. until after the purchase. Right. And that's when the regret seeps in. However, I will say this. We get questions about letting go of regret. Let me talk to you. It's simple to let go of regret. Mm -hmm. Regret is the easiest negative emotion. I'm negative in quotes here. Negative emotion to let go of because as soon as you learn the lesson Mm -hmm. from the regret, you let go of the regret. Yeah. Because you've learned the lesson now and it's turned into something productive. I know not to do that again. And so letting go isn't something you do. It just drops automatically as soon as you learn the lesson from that regret. The problem is, there's that great lyric from Drew from uh, Parlor Hawk when he said, I learned a lot of good lessons here that I choose to forget. When we forget the lessons, then we're going to make the same mistakes. That regret is going to come back again and again if we're not learning the lesson. The great segue. It's the lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and your comments to 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Those texts go to both of our phones. We respond to as many people as we can, including some folks on the podcast. Now, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer your questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We call them minimal maxims, and we put them in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you like. By the way, you can find all of our minimal maxims and one place now, minimalmaxims.com. Ryan, we have a question from Lauren, Alabama. What do I do when purchasing anything gives me buyer's remorse? I end up feeling guilty for every non-essential purchase, and I don't understand why. Hmm. I understand why. And it's because we get confused. Mm. We think there are, there's such a thing as non-essential purchases and essential purchases, and that's it. Mm, yeah, but there's actually three categories. We call it the no junk rule. Right, it's in that minimalist rule book that we have, and the no junk rule basically says everything you own, everything you purchase, everything you want, everything you desire, mm-hmm. everything you've owned in the past, yeah, every material good can fit in one of three piles. It's either essential, non essential, or it's junk. We all have basic essentials. So yes, the essentials. You never regret buying something that's essential. Right. Food, shelter. Although you might regret buying too much of a thing. Mm. Oh, I bought and ate an entire cheesecake. I certainly regret that, right? I bought too big of a house. I bought too expensive of a car. And so you regret those things because you're not regretting the essential. You're regretting the parts of those things that are non-essential that you're not getting value from. Yeah. Now, the non-essential things are the things that add value to your life. But the junk are the things that masquerade as though they add value. Mm. And the reason, Lauren, you get confused here, you end up feeling guilty, is because you are mistaking the non-essentials and the junk. Because it's easy to do. I saw it in that ad and it looked so essential. Mm -hmm. It looked so value-adding. But then I got it. Mm -hmm. I didn't get any value from it. And so if you don't get any value from it, what is it? It's junk. Here's my pithy answer for you. Mm -hmm. If everything is valuable, nothing is valuable. Preach. Now that's a definition, you know, right? By definition, if everything has the same value, then it's all worth functionally zero. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful because you'll value something differently from the next person. So yes, you might see someone who gets immense value from that blender or from that toaster. 
But if you don't eat toast, then you're not going to get the same value as someone else who gets immense value from the toaster. Mm. So choose those caref- those pr- those purchases carefully. Yeah. So uh, are, is what you're saying is kind of like she is uh, she's feeling guilty when she buys junk. Yes. Yes. Because okay. she feels as though, oh, this is supposed to add value to my life. And then I get it. Yeah. And I realize it doesn't. So you yeah. have to think about it beforehand. Is this going to add value to my life is an important question. We have those five questions to ask before buying. In fact, you can have it as a free wallpaper download for your phone. So anytime you're somewhere before you make that purchase, Mm -hmm. you can just download that. We'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Or you can just download it on our resources page over at theminimalists.com. It's just a free wallpaper. It says, all right, I'm going to ask these five questions. And one of those questions is, will this add value to my life? Yeah. And maybe expand on that. In what ways will this add value to my life? Mm -hmm. Is this worth the money I'm going to part with? That's another one of those questions. And so Mm -hmm. asking those questions beforehand will help you avoid the future regret. Mm. We were talking on the live stream before we started recording this, Ryan. Uh, I released a novel in my 20s, published a novel called As a Decade Fades. It was my my first book. And uh, the main character, Jody Grafton in there, he's like a singer-songwriter. He's tattoo laden singer songwriter and one of the tattoos on his arm says future regrets Mm -hmm. on it and i feel like we all need that tattoo in a way yeah they're to remind us that hey this decision i'm about to make might lead to some of these these future regrets yeah oh man uh my pithy answer is this uh shame is tamed when guilt is jilted so what does jilted mean? <laughs> well, we, you, you could tell Josh helped me edit this uh, pithy answer. <laughs> oh, I, I loved where you were going with it. And so I was driving here this morning and I was uh, voice dictating, trying to voice dictate uh, how to you know, make this pithy. And I said, how would this look on a poster? Because you were talking about guilt and shame. Mm-hmm. And and really, I think the more accurate description here, although I think that what you have there looks great on a minimal maxim image, sure. but... Uh, Guilt or shame is tamed when guilt is understood. Yes. When you understand the source of your guilt, Mm -hmm. the behaviors tend to change and then the shame goes away on its own. Yes. Now, yeah, guilt means to like let go of, to kind of walk away from. And once you understand it, it's easier to walk away from it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got so much more to talk about, Ryan. But first, real quick for right here, right now. I'm so excited to share this with you. We've been working on this for almost a year now, and we're finally announcing it. And we're announcing it through this essay. So I'm going to read this essay for you. This is our right here, right now segment on the Minimalist Podcast. And this essay is called, This Much Debt is Gross. Ryan, our society has a problem. Most people are financially illiterate, and it's not even their fault. Because we don't learn how to manage money as kids, we are easily convinced by corporations to go into debt as young adults, buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. Mm. When we spend, then we spend years mired in the mess we've made, credit card debt, student loans, car payments, and myriad other ways we borrow from our future. The average indebted American household has $97,775 in non-mortgage debt. How gross is that? What? Say that again. The average indebted American household has $97,775 in non-mortgage related debt. So a car could be in there. Car, credit card, student loans are the th- three big ones. Everything but your mortgage, yeah. That's yeah. those are the three big. It, it, that's actually, in fact, it's that number is from those three things added up together. It's crippling. Yes, but if we can teach students, if we can teach kids how to stay out of debt, then we can end the suffering that is compounded by debt. And that's what Ryan and I want to do today. That's why the minimalists, we are partnering with Ramsey Education this year in 2022 to bring the foundations and personal finance curriculum, get this, to every school in our hometown, Dayton, Ohio. Every school. Heck yeah. Would you be willing to help us? And here's what we're asking for. So over the, the past decade, the minimalists and our audience have contributed to nine philanthropic projects, including building two orphanages, providing relief to American hurricane victims, constructing an elementary school, and establishing a nonprofit grocery co-op in one of the largest food deserts in the United States. And now, this year, with your help, we're going to teach 
personal finance to every middle and high school student in Dayton. Every middle school student, every high school student in Dayton. And if we reach our $40,000 goal quickly, we can expand this to other cities all across the United States. Now, the Foundations and Personal Finance teaches students proven money principles that will set them up for a debt-free life. The problem is many schools don't have the resources they need to provide this curriculum to their students. And that's how we and you can help. You can purchase the curriculum for just one child, and it's really inexpensive. Or you can do it for multiple children if you're feeling really generous. Mm -hmm. But $25 provides the curriculum for one middle school student. Mm. $45 provides the curriculum for one high school student. Mm. And if you don't have $25 or $45, then $5. You can donate as little as $5, and you can help provide the curriculum for some students. And that's I awesome, man. Could you imagine if we had this when we were kids? It'd be the best. Oh, it would have saved me like 10 years of like pain and anguish, man. All that suffering. Of all the crappy financial decisions I've made. Yeah. yeah. So by contributing, you'll help these kids start their adult life the right way. And like I said, we're going to try to expand this to other schools as well beyond the city of Dayton. But we want to start with our hometown. Yeah. And then we'll we'll move on beyond there. And we could really use your help. We, we're not going to make any money from this personally. In fact, I got a whole thing about this. But if you want to donate, theminimalists.com slash education. That'll take you right to the page. There's a lot of frequently asked questions there. There's the progress bar, et cetera, et cetera. And seriously, if you spend 70 bucks here, you can provide curriculum for one middle school student, one high school student. You're, mm-hmm. you're literally just going in there providing the curriculum for a student. Or with a $40,000 donation. <laughs> you can yeah provide it for the whole city. Exactly. <laughs> in fact, you wouldn't even have to be that, do that much. And here's why. To be clear, the minimalist won't earn any money from this project. I just wanted to put that out there. So it doesn't sound like we're making Whatever. money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> We're actually going to lose money on it. I know. I'm going to explain why here in a second. So yeah. every penny that you donate, literally every penny, 100% will be used for student curriculum. Mm. In fact, Ryan and I are personally donating $2,500 of our own money to fund the first 100 students. So if you want to help us change the future for these kids, theminimalists.com slash education. If you go there, Um, You'll find commonly asked questions. You'll find all the details. You'll find our fundraiser progress bar. And after you donate, we'll email you with updates about the impact of your contribution, the impact that it's having on actual students' lives. Now, Ryan, I want to go through this real quick since we're doing this. We have the Foundations in Personal Finance Curriculum. I went through this this course, which, by the way, it's a 13-hour course. Mm-hmm. I didn't go through the whole thing, but I went through all of the curriculum yeah. because I want to make sure that as we're helping them create this for, for the students, that it was something I was 100% behind because I know I'm behind Dave Ramsey's method, and but I want to make sure that this is going to be help. And not only will it help, but I would have been interested in this as a high schooler mm. because it's not here's the credits and debits, molten rock is magma. Like it's actual stuff I want to want to learn, right? And so here's uh, the 13 different things that the contents of this course, you have introduction to personal finance, you have budgeting, you have saving money, you have credit versus debit, you have consumer awareness, career readiness, college planning, financial services, the role of insurance, income and taxes, housing and real estate, investing and retirement, global economics, but they do it in a way so that's there's like really four parts to the whole curriculum. There are videos, mm. which you know in high school, you would have much rather watch videos than just read a bunch of textbooks, right? Oh, yeah. So you have videos for every one of these. You have student textbooks that you could follow along, but the videos are the main thing. You have teacher's guides and you have activities for students. So they're actually engaged in the learning. Yeah. 25 bucks, you can bring this curriculum to a student. $45, you can bring it to a high school student. Mm -hmm. If you want to help, theminimalists.com slash education. We'd really, really appreciate if you'd contribute. Ryan and I rarely ask for anything for ourselves from you. Mm. We want to help these kids well, not borrow from their future. Yeah. So you can brighten their future today for 25 bucks. Man, thank you so much. Maliban, what else you got for us? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Hi, Josh and Ryan. This is Bianca speaking. I'm calling from the Netherlands. I have a tip for Ryan and his double swimming trunk dilemma and a travel tip in general, I hope. 
Ryan told us he didn't like packing an extra set of swimming trunks just in case the first one got dirty on the trip. Personally, I like to use Dr. Bronner's All One Kestar soap. I have to add that I am in no way, shape or form affiliated with this company. Dr. Bronner sells um, a pure Kestar liquid soap, which can be used for over 18 different purposes. Purposes. You can use this to clean your face, body, hair, dishes, laundry, the whole shebang. So while you're traveling, you'll only need this soap. And Ryan, you can hand wash your swimming trunks. I also love this company for using organic and certified fair trade ingredients. Plus, they're packaged in recyclable bottles. I really like their philosophy on how to treat the earth and their suppliers. I think this will appeal to many fellow minimalists. I hadn't heard a recommendation on Dr. Bonner's soap before, so I hope this will help some of you out there. Hi, my name is Taylor, and I'm from Tampa, Florida. I was listening to the Nostalgia episode, and as someone who's a younger minimalist, um, I don't have a whole lot of things necessarily, but I did have a lot of T-shirts that I had accumulated from high school and also from college events, and they all do trigger um, a lot of great memories for me, but they were really clogging up my closet. Um, and so from the transition, uh, after college, I actually took all of the T-shirts and cut them up and made a no-sew blanket. So I'd suggest that anyone who has a lot of T-shirts, um, that would be a useful way for them to get a use out of them. It's great size. It's small. I can travel with it when I go uh, across the state um, or when I get on air. Uh, just keep all those little things that might trigger nostalgia about an event you went to or about uh, maybe a club you joined um, without having the extra bulk. All right, y'all, before we get to our added value segment today, here's a thoughtful comment from one of our lovely Patreon subscribers. Sandy said, I appreciate all the different perspectives shared by you and your guests. It gives me hope that people from different backgrounds and religions can live respectfully and peacefully together. I don't know if I talked about this on the podcast yet, but... That's pretty awesome, man. Yeah, well... Sorry. Go, yeah. what, what really blew my mind is this made me think about... When, when she, she left this comment, it made me think about... We were in Washington, D.C. recently. It was me and you and T.K. Coleman and Ken Coleman. Mm -hmm. No relation. Mm -hmm. We call them the Brothers Coleman, but I don't think they're related. And anyway, what I realized while we were on the stage, and I didn't mention it there, although it was January 6th, which was strange. We're in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Yeah. It was two years later, but mm -hmm. still, it was an uh, insurrection of love and joy. Yes. And what I realized, all four of us voted differently in the last election. Mm. And yet, we love each other. Mm -hmm. We care about each other. We're compassionate toward one another. Mm. We're loving towards... I mean, I, I accept and respect all three of you so much. Mm. Not because you voted the same way as me, or I need you to vote the same way, or I need you to have the same beliefs. Mm. That becomes a prison when I need everyone else around me to be just like me. Yeah, It's self-righteousness, and it makes us miserable. So, Sandy, thank you so much for that comment. She said, I'm a careful budgeter, and I limit my subscription expenses, but I finally justified Ryan's OnlyFans. <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise known as uh the minimalist patreon yeah yeah sorry there, there are not any uh lewd pictures on our patreon or should... pictures of fans <laughs> <laughs> well there might be some like some of our audience some of those fans on there that you can talk to but that's about it yeah the only fans you're gonna see on there <laughs> You know, when I say it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> she said, um, I justified this Patreon expense because I, I'm i sure that listening to your private podcast saves me more money than the cost of the subscription. You know, I will tell you that our podcast, Jordan can testify this, it actually cures gout as well. <laughs> Consult your doctor before subscribing to our Patreon. <laughs> this has not been confirmed by the FDA. Ryan, I have an amazing added value this week. Mm. It's my favorite album of the year so far. There's this gal, young gal named uh, Jensen McRae, mm -hmm. and it's her debut album. The album is called Are You Happy Now? And this is the, the title track to it. It's called Starting to Get to You because clutter and consumerism are starting to get to a lot of our listeners. Mm. 
And this album, it just really stuck with me. The The whole album's beautiful. This song, I think you'll especially appreciate. The lyric that really stood out to me when she's talking about loving you is habit forming. Mm. And I won't go on to a whole diatribe about habits right now, but it's such a beautiful, beautiful song. She is such a profoundly unique artist, but she reminded me of two other really unique artists. Uh, Tracy Chapman, we all know. Mm-hmm. Do you know Maggie Rogers? Mm-mm. She has a great song called Alaska, but I'm reminded of this video that Maggie Rogers, uh, podcast Sean, put a link to this video in the show notes. Maggie Rogers at a music school and Pharrell comes in to critique their songs. Oh, wow. Imagine how much pressure you'd be under if Pharrell Williams came in. Oh, my goodness. You'd you'd want to run and hide. Yeah. Anyway, she plays this song for him and you see him listening and you're like, "Uh uh-oh, what's wrong? And then you just see him like, like he's bowled over with emotion. Mm. And afterward, he told her, this reminds me of the first time I heard the Wu-Tang Clan. And you're like, what? This sounds nothing. She's like folk dance music in a way. Yeah. And he's like, it's utterly unique. I have no way to compare this to it. I have no reference range mm. for any. When Wu-Tang came out, I was like, there's nothing else you could say. Oh, it sounds like this. It doesn't sound like right. anything. Right. And her music was similar. And then I heard, I heard this song from Jensen McRae. It's called Starting to Get to You, and it reminded me of that where it was profoundly unique. By the way, Ryan, we have a bunch more surprise questions this week, like, what are Josh and Ryan's top three personal consumer regrets? What are the most interesting consumer regrets from our audience? Here are some hints. That list includes wedding dresses, gym memberships, Botox, Pelotons, cars, pets, homes, paper planners, and much more. Also, why are the minimalists considering leaving social media altogether? (laughs) Plus a million more questions for the minimalists. And if you want to hear all that, check out the minimalist private podcast this week. Visit patreon.com slash the minimalist to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to hundreds of hours of private archives, recordings of live events, exclusive home tours, and our private community of thousands of open-minded minimizers like you. You can follow The Minimalists on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, at The Minimalists. If you want our podcast show notes in your inbox, just sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. On behalf of Ryan Nicodemus, Podcast Sean, Alabama, Jordan No More, Social Jess, Danny Unknown, Emma the Immigrant, and the rest of our team, I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. If you leave here today with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it